In 2016, we launched our bold plan to make sustainable chocolate the norm. It's time to add fresh ambition to our targets, going beyond 2025, to continue leading change today and driving impact for people and planet. Forever Chocolate, making sustainable chocolate the norm. Hello and a very warm welcome from Barry Calibut headquarters for the launch of our sharpened Forever Chocolate plan. My name is Taryn Ridley. And my name is Christian Prince and we will be your two moderators for this broadcast. Yes, and actually Christian, I remember very well back in 2016 we were both present. Yes, we were. Yes, for the launch of Forever Chocolate, our plan to make sustainable chocolate the norm by 2025. And this was based on four key ambitions, to lift 500,000 and farmers out of poverty, to eradicate child labour from our supply chain, to become uh, to uh, become carbon and forest positive, and to have 100% sustainable ingredients in all of our products. Now, clearly, it's not 2025 yet. Uh, that's true, Taryn. But as you know, sustainability is not static. It's very dynamic. So already when we launched Forever Chocolate in 2016, we knew that our targets would have to be dynamic as well. And thanks to Forever Chocolate, we've had so many learnings and we've spoken to so many external people that provided feedback that it's just natural that we update um, and, and sharpen our Forever Chocolate uh, uh, targets. So that's basically what we're presenting today. Yep. And key to that, I mean, beyond the expertise of our own people, is that engagement and collaboration with external stakeholders, because Forever Chocolate has always been about creating that movement. And I think that today is actually testament to those voices, those external voices. So not only will we deep dive into our new strategy, but we'll also hear from external external stakeholders as well. Absolutely. So in the coming 45 minutes, you will see a broad range of external experts providing their insights and comments on material issues for the sustainable cocoa and chocolate supply chain, including child labor, um, cocoa farmer income and the carbon footprint of chocolate. Yes. And after those discussions, we will welcome you back here for a live Q&A with some of our external, uh, sorry, with some of our um, sustainability experts. Now, if you haven't already had an opportunity to scan the QR code, there's also a link at the top of your screen. If you copy and paste that and put that into a new tab, you can use that to submit any questions that you have throughout the duration of the discussions. Oh, I'm truly looking forward to seeing all the questions coming in. And with that, Taryn, I think it's time yes. to kick off. Exactly. So um, let's do so by taking a deep dive in exactly how Body Callabout has sharpened its existing targets and what new targets we have put forward for 2030 and beyond. And for that, we are going to listen to our pillar leads, Nicolas, Nilke, Oliver and Tilman. For Prospect Farmer for 2025, we stick to our target of seeing half a million farmers being lifted out of poverty. We just want to focus on more doing and less training. We think that farmers know how to grow cocoa, they just need to be supported in how to invest more in their cocoa farm. And for 2030, we think that the journey towards living income requires a large mobilization of stakeholders, from NGO to the cocoa sector and government. Child labor is a systemic problem and it needs a systemic approach. Therefore, we work with the enablers, which are the social and economic structures in the cocoa communities. We do that through the development of children, families and communities. Our 2025 target is bringing our full supply chain under an impactful human rights due diligence process, remediating all child labour cases identified. Our 2030 target is empowering the cocoa communities to protect child rights. With a new strategy in the Thriving Nature Pillar, we're really focusing on decarbonizing our own business and our own value chain rather than compensating elsewhere. For us, that means we really double down our efforts on preventing any further deforestation and aim to become forest positive by 2025. In addition, we're scaling up agroforestry as fast as possible and invest into renewable energy and into low carbon logistics and transport. We're committed to doing so aligned with the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree target which means by 2050, latest, we will become net zero and we will also set an interim target for 2030. For us, net zero is a journey and we're going in for the long run 
while aiming to improve year after year after year along this journey. We hope you will join us on this way. We're changing the wording from sustainable to certified and verified to reflect how we work with certifications, but also our own programs like Cocoa Horizons or Vision Dairy. And we're focusing more on traceability to farm by 2030. That provided an excellent overview. I think it's now time to look into each of the individual pillars. What are the material issues at hand? What solutions are there to solve them? And who should take action? Let's start with Cocoa Farmer Income. Deborah, thank you for joining me. Do you get the income, the sort of income that you require from this farm? I could say I'm not making much, but at least I have uh, the income to also invest in the farm. Uh, this is because I think that due to the climate impact I talked about, it's making uh, management costs rise up each and every season. The cost for labor, the cost for imports is rising. And so I'm not getting enough as I expect to get but at least I have something to reinvest to get uh, the productivity that I want here. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Forever Chocolates. The new approach focuses on giving additional farm inputs, soil input, premium payments, and subsidized um, input for farmers. In your opinion, are these the things that we should be focusing on, or there are other areas you think that we should focus on? I, I think it's one of the major things or the major things a farmer needs. Uh, currently, if you look at the cost the farmer is putting in the farm, it's all on inputs, it's all on management practices they have to do on the farm. And so if there's a program to subsidize the input price for a farmer, it means it's waiving off majority of the cost the farmer has to incur. And the good thing is if the farmer gets a premium uh, at the end of the season for the work done, it also helped the farmer to invest more in their farm, invest in other livelihood activities to better their income. So I think it's a very good thing if farmers receive uh, such support. And how does it go a long way to support um, their production over maybe a long period? Because you've given me the background of when farmers were not earning a lot. How would this go a long way to support them? Okay. So with farm imports now, they need it as uh, one of the mitigation measures to climate because there's a lot of uh, pest infestation, a lot of diseases infestation. And so if farmers are not getting the money to buy inputs to uh, manage their farm, they end up getting a low productivity. And so when this input comes in, then they get high productivity, which translates into the incomes they are receiving. And then also when they get premium, they can invest in the farm or expand their farms or get additional source of uh, income. And this will help better their lives, yeah. So Deborah, if you had a magic wand, what would you wish for to support you in your farming? If I had a magic wand today, I would wish for a supply and inputs, and then also funding to support me purchase uh, climate resilient uh, plants or seedlings, and then also invest in my uh, farms to be more adaptive to climate. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thanks for having me. Interesting insights from the farmer, Christian. Clearly, uh, farmers are asking for more investment capacity into their farms, for more uh, premium payments, for example, and investment into labour. So really, you can see this shift from a focus from, I guess, less training into more doing. Absolutely, Taryn. I think it, it highlights the constantly evolving landscape of building a sustainable chocolate and cocoa supply chain. So what can we effectively do to support cocoa farmers? And how do we build collective action amongst cocoa and chocolate companies? For this, I spoke to the president of the World Cocoa Foundation, Chris Vincent. Chris, thank you so much for being with us today. You are the president of the World Cocoa Foundation. For people not familiar, what is the World Cocoa Foundation? Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, the World Cocoa Foundation is an international membership organisation uh, that represents over 80% of the cocoa sector. Um, and our exclusive focus is sustainability. So we seek to convene um, our membership 
uh, to work together collaboratively to address the sustainability issues in the sector today. What do you feel are some of the key systemic issues that should be tackled through collective action? Um, I think there are three key issues. Um, the first one is poverty, uh, because it underlies the two other issues as well. So we seek to significantly improve um, the income of the cocoa farmer. Secondly, we seek to um, stop deforestation in the cocoa supply chain uh, and promote reforestation and conservation. Uh, and thirdly, we seek to combat child labour. Clear. Now, let's be honest, industry has not always been successful to achieve impact through its collective action. Harkin Engel Protocol is one example. Where do you feel it sometimes goes wrong and how can we amend that? Absolutely. Uh, and over our 20 year um, history since the Harkin Engel Pro Protocol, uh, we've learned two key lessons. Um, the first lesson is the way that we can work together to get companies to collaborate. Um, that is not as easy as it sounds because companies are naturally competitive, uh, but we believe um, through one of the programs that we ran called Coco Action, we've developed ways in which companies collaborate well pre-competitively. Secondly, we've learned um, that partnerships and collaboration with industry only go so far. We also need that partnership with government as well. Chris, final question. Looking forward, what do you think we could do differently or more of through collective action? Uh, I think there are two areas. Um, the first thing is to move our focus away from the short term challenges to the longer term. Uh, and by that, I mean, we are seeking to align industry's long term development goals for the sector with each producing country's national economic plans, agricultural plans and cocoa plans. So we align cocoa development with economic growth and agricultural progress. And we're also looking to support um, each country's national initiatives. Uh, and at the moment, the key focus is on the national traceability systems uh, and the implementation of the African regional standard. And if we do both of those, I think we'll build much greater partnerships and we need partnerships between industry and government to deliver transformative impact. Very clear. So long-term partnerships with also a strong focus on supporting um, government agendas. Absolutely. Chris, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Interesting comments by Chris Vincent, clearly showing the power of collective action. Absolutely, Taryn. And under our sharpened Forever Chocolate plan, Body Colorado has also committed to bring together a group of stakeholders behind a transformative cocoa farming model generating a living income. But what does this mean? What are the building blocks of such a model? For this, we invited Anthony Fountain from The Voice Network to discuss with Nicolas Munar. Nicolas, Anthony, thank you very much for joining me. Um, Nicolas, I'm going to start with you. Um, Buddy Calabat has committed to bringing together a group of stakeholders around a transformative cocoa farming model generating a living income. Could you elaborate? What are the main building blocks of this model? Well, there's two things that need to happen. One is on the systemicity program side and one is on the policy side. We need the right policy framework and we need the right set of activity. When it comes to the right set of activity on the systemicity side, I think our key assumption is that the problem is not knowledge, uh, the problem is uh, investment. So we, we tend to summarize it by uh, less training and more doing. We don't necessarily believe that the problem is knowledge. Uh, farmers know how to grow cocoa. We believe that the problem is how you help them to uh, invest more in their farm. So a lot of our activity are geared towards this. And then on the policy framework, our data says that basically what can generate uh, poverty reduction is the combination of higher price, higher yield, and also bigger farm. So we also really want to move beyond that ideological fight of like yield versus price. We think it's the combination of both that can make it happen, but we need the right policy framework to make it happen. Understood. So beyond the ideological divide, mm -hmm. Anthony, you are the Managing Director of The Voice Network, a network of NGOs and trade unions focusing on sustainability in COCO. You quite recently published uh, the Living Income Compendium. You published, of course, your COCO Barometer. What would be your main building blocks for generating a living income for COCO farmers? 
So part of that is is in alignment with what Nico just said. We think there's three key elements that need to happen. And one of those is around the agronomics. So kind of the productivity, the crop diversification, all those things. Um, but that's kind of the top of the pyramid. And that rests on two very key pillars that need to be there as well. And that's the good governance. So access to market, education, other infrastructural things that need to be there, transparency in the supply chain. And the other second pillar is around purchasing practices. And part of that is a higher price. Part of that is as well, how do you de-risk the world for the farmers? Because at the moment, the farmer takes all the risks of investing in his farm. Now that's asking the weakest shoulders to carry the heaviest burdens, and that needs to change as well. And so it's not a divide between price and productivity, but price actually makes the productivity a business case for the farmer. Okay. So farmer is taking most of the risk at mm -hmm. the moment in the current setup. Uh, Nicola, how would you respond to that? I would agree with that. Uh, I think we, we, we would agree with the strategy of de-risking. Um, what, we, what we observe through the data is at the moment there is very little investment in the farm. Depending on the year, roughly between $80 and $120 um, invested in the farm. In order to increase the productivity, you need to invest more, probably depending on the cost of production, but somewhere between five and $700. So obviously you need to accompany farmer. You cannot expect farmer to make that massive increase of risk and massive increase of cost, cost of production. That's also why we want to do less training and more doing is because we, we, we think we need to help them uh, bridging that gap. And we've done that a lot by subsidizing uh, labor, for example, there's not enough labor invested in the farm. Also by keeping the price of, uh, of fertilizer at a, at a reasonable level. But for that, uh, we think we can save money on the, on the training. Again, we don't think that uh, farmers do not know how to farm. They know how to farm cocoa. So helping them to de-risk by accompanying them on that increase of cost of production is something we would completely agree with. Okay. So focus on, 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 on providing inputs. It's not so much that the farmer doesn't know how to use them, but he needs to have access to that, to that investment. Yeah. Um, Anthony, Productivity is often, of course, something which is which is mentioned when mm -hmm. you support farmers in becoming more productive. Yeah. What's your viewpoint on that? Productivity is not the magic bullet that solves all the problems. Now, quite a few farmers are at a subpar productivity level, right? Our analysis shows that kind of though the average farmer does, does about 500, 600 kilos a hectare, half of the farmers are actually doing it about 350 or less. Now, getting them up to five or 600 kilos a hectare makes sense. It actually brings in net revenue. Going further above that, with the current variables in play, actually doesn't increase the net income of farmers, which is a bit of a tricky thing. And so kind of there's a, there's a threshold until which it's actually quite interesting to help farmers become more professional. Above that, you're going to have to change other dials. Including can you elaborate a little bit on that? Why, why is it not, no longer working? Because it costs a lot of time to grow cocoa. It's a labor intensive thing and labor is not free. Labor is not unlimited. Um, and if you do approach labor as a free and an unlimited supply, you're going to look for free and unlimited labor supplies, which is one of the reasons I think that cocoa has a child labor problem is, is that we've actually very often not factored labor into the calculations that we have. And so you need to find ways that there's a business model if you're going to hire labor that that's remunerative. And part of that is through making sure that you're paying them enough. I think part of it, it's not just about making the input accessible. It's also creating a stable working environment for the farmers. And so actually we're arguing for long-term contracts. A company like Cullabout knows how much cocoa you're going to need in five or six years. You could probably forward contract with farms or with cooperatives for five, six years, giving them a bankable security, saying, we've got a contract to supply X amount of kilos to call about for the next five years. You know, investors like that, those kind of contracts. So that's also a way that you can de-risk de it, not just by helping with inputs, but actually providing them security. So, so there's a whole variety of interventions that are necessary, higher prices, long-term contracts, and we need to get a lot better grip on how much time it takes to grow cocoa, because I think that's probably a big point of contention is around the size of the farms, mm. right? A lot of times we hear this conversation around, oh, but that's, you know, we need a minimum viable farm size. Farms are actually households and households have a limited amount of labor. So I actually think it's more that we're going to be talking about a maximum viable farm size per household rather than a minimum viable farm size for poverty. Right. 
I mean, that's a fair point that Anthony is bringing up. I mean, cocoa farming is predominantly happening on, on, on smallholder farms. Now, I also hear there is probably, as Anthony says, a, a, a maximum of, 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 of yield above which it starts to get more difficult. Does that fit also in the model that Body Color about champion? Partly. Uh, I think there, there are three points on which I would like to answer. First of all, I think on the yield question, quite often we, we, we forget the kind of macroeconomic environment. And I think Ivory Coast is, is a good example. Uh, at the moment, Ivory Coast produced probably 2 to 2.2 million tons across 4.5 million hectares. And you have 70% of Ivory Coast that is farmed, so you really have a, a problem of land. Uh, Ivory Coast is a net importer of food, so they need to import rice, for example, to feed their people. And they also have a commitment to reforest the country. So at the moment, you only have 9% of Ivory Coast that is under forest. They have a commitment to move that to 20%, which is 3.5 million hectares to reforest. So if you take that into account, there's no doubt that the same amount of cocoa need to be produced on less land in order for more land to be dedicated to reforestation and more land being dedicated to feeding people and, uh, and growing staple food. That would be larger farms, yes. I guess. Then on the two other points of Anthony, I think on the contract, we obviously agree with that. Just keep in mind that we're, we're B2B players, so we, we try to mirror the commitment of our customer. We've implemented in Ivory Coast a new, a new contract that mirror the commitment of our customer. So we are, we are all uh, up for multi-year contract. I think that's a completely fair point. You also help the de-risking. On the bigger farm question, I think there's two elements that contradict each other. You're right in the, in the sense that uh, the bigger the farm is today, the lower the yield is. That's something we verify in our data. But if you turn things around and you look at the, uh, the amount of the, the, the farmers that are making to living income, bigger farm is part of uh, their characteristic. So you're right in the sense that going for bigger farm, if you cannot sustain the right level of investment, doesn't make any sense. But bigger farm with the right level of investment makes sense in terms of business model, even if we factor labor. Yeah, and I think that's where you get to the point where the agricultural practices are part of it, but they need this, this enabling environment of the right governance and the right purchasing practices yeah. to create the interest there. Because there's models that show that farms can get up to 1,500 kilos a hectare, right? But only after a long period of investment and a, a, a long period of very little income because you're renovating the farms. Now, if you want that to happen, you're going to have to create the security for the farmer for him to be willing or her to be willing to make that risk. And I think that that environment is not in any way, shape or form in the cocoa sector at the moment. And so we're talking about what we'd like to see and we're talking about what we're seeing, but there's a very big gap between the two. And so for us, the challenge is how do we take the conversation from kind of a great theory on paper and look at the current reality in the field? And that requires steps now as well, which is higher prices, longer term contracts for farmers. I think those two elements together are the things that a company can do already in the short term without all the macroeconomic stuff having to be in play which I agree on, but I think that sometimes that's an excuse or that's seen as a, as a reason why we can't move faster than, than we're doing at the moment, but we can move faster. And we, we're not talking about, uh, about the excuse here. And I, and I agree with your, with your point that it's all about time management. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have a, a time period during which the farmer needs to transform the way cocoa is farmed, and that period carries a lot of risk. So you need to de-risk that period that can be three years, four years or, or, or five, five years. And we need to have that kind of long term logic that allow us to really have a vision of the progressive step that a farm needs to take to reach that level. And you're right, it's three or five years. And then you, you need to help that, uh, that transition. You cannot uh, ask uh, a Clear. farmer in Ivory Coast at the moment to make that uh, investment without any sense of security. Very clear. I think that there are, there's a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, about, it's about governance, it's about productivity, it's about price. Mm -hmm. um, I think the focus needs to be on, uh, we're talking about a transition here, mm -hmm. uh, a timely transition. How do you make sure you create already now? I think that's what I hear you say, Anthony, the right conditions that also in the current state, mm -hmm. uh, farmers are enabled to make this transition. Um, but what I'm sensing from Body Calibre is that actually that willingness is there. Yeah. Then I thank you very much, Anthony. I thank you very much, Nicholas, Thanks, for this good Thanks, conversation. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed that uh, discussion. And to be very honest, I did not even find them that far apart. They were both underlying the importance of 
Cocoa Farmer input of good governance and of course also of price. And with that, we are closing our deep dive into our first pillar on prospering farmers. Let's look at our second pillar, human rights. We heard previously from Nilke of the shift that we have made to a pillar focusing on human rights due diligence, adding also an additional approach, community-centered, to fight child labor. Christian, it's quite a complex uh, terminology, but what does it mean? Let's listen to an interview between Lorencia and Joyce Pokumabo from Rainforest Alliance. Joyce, thank you for joining us. Why hasn't uh, child labor been eradicated? Yeah, the issue of child labor is complex and um, it has to be tackled holistically and then in a collaborative way. Um, it requires a, the joint effort of government, civil society organizations, companies in supply chain, and even the farmers themselves. Oftentimes, um, interventions that support um, child labor eradication targets one aspect, let's say poverty. And um, beyond poverty, we have other issues, other root causes, like the gender inequality. We have weak enforcement of law. We have um, issues of uh, inadequate child protection systems in the country. And the, using the supply chain approach towards um, tackling child labor, you realize that um, interventions target um, a few of the root causes, let's say poverty, and not the others. So if you don't tackle it holistically by taking care of all the other root causes, then you'll be spending a lot of money, but you will not be making progress in a commensurate way. So it's important that um, resources are put together so that um, interventions can benefit um, a wider group of people. Then. But in areas where there are interventions, progress, progress is being made. Child labor is going down. But areas where there are no interventions, child labor is on the increase. So I'll say that we need a joint effort to do that. Right. And over the past years, uh, more of the industry initi initiatives have embraced the supply chain approach um, to tackle the issue of child labor. And that's more of dedicating a lot of um, effort to case by case identification, remediation, among others. Do you think that it is important that industry starts to shift towards a more community based approach? Yeah, I think so. Um, industry has done a lot and much more has to be done. Um, the supply chain approach focuses on the cocoa, um, children of cocoa farmers in their supply chain. But when you think about the community approach, you are thinking about the lives of all the children in the community or in the landscape. So you find um, a, number of a number of, let's say, um, supply chain actors in a community um, targeting their farmers, traceability. So they work in silos, not working together. And when it happens that way, it's like a lot of resources go into interventions, but not much is felt. Um, you can vouch for the loyalty of a cocoa farmer. He may belong to two or three different cocoa companies. So you would be sure that the um, involved child of such a person may benefit from different companies, while there are others in the community who do not benefit. And then once you support this child and the others are there, you can be sure that your child will certainly be at risk of child labor. He has been supported, but the others have not. And the other way, um, I think things are changing. You do the immediate remediation of getting the child back to school but you have to support the parents. That is a more sustainable way. So um, if the parent is supported with an entrepreneurial skills to bring in additional income, then beyond the support you gave to the child, going forward, the parents will be able to take care of the, that child and then even other children as well. 
a new approach to child labour and human rights presented by Joyce. Indeed, Christian. This now closes our second pillar on human rights. Let's move now to our third pillar, Thriving Nature. Absolutely, Taryn. And let's start with Buddy Calabout's commitment to become forest positive, which of course means to get rid of deforestation from your supply chain, but also to add trees through agroforestry. Now, on deforestation, we've seen a lot of private initiative initiatives, but how effective have they been? Or do we require public policy to create a level playing field. The EU has recently concluded its EU deforestation regulation. How effective will this be? For this, Elena Gozun spoke to Julia Christian from the NGO FERN. Hi Julia, thank you very much for joining us today. So one of the core activities of your work at FERN is also to support and to, to advocate for EU policies that aim to protect forests and also the environment. A landmark initiative in this respect is the recently agreed EU deforestation regulation. What are your views on the final outcome of the negotiations? Do you think that um, the element of prohibition is the right way to go ahead? The regulation is an absolutely vital step forward in the fight against global deforestation. And I think the prohibition element is central. It's critical. The, the strict traceability requirement that comes along with that prohibition is also what gives it a potentially game-changing effect. And I think it, it sends a very clear message to all actors in that supply chain, and especially the cocoa sector, um, that the mode of production needs to change. What about remediation? As you know, the action of remediation is not embedded within the regulation, which means that on long term, it will not necessarily stimulate uh, actions such as reforestation, landscape approach to deforestation. How do you think this plays out in the broader uh, purpose of the regulation of uh, that of fighting global deforestation? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's actually key that the regulation doesn't allow for remediation of that type because the intention of the regulation is to stop deforestation and primary forests are not interchangeable with agroforestry or reforested landscapes. When it comes to biodiversity, uh, if, if you cut down a, a primary tropical forest, especially tropical forest, it takes centuries for it to get back to its previous state. What about the farmer? Once the farmer cut down a forest, a piece of forest, right, to plant cocoa trees there, and a company identifies uh, his actions, that would mean automatically that he will have to be dropped out of the supply chain. How do you see these two um, elements going hand in hand? The fact that remediation is not part of the regulation, but that also means that basically a company cannot really support the farmer in preserving his livelihood. I think we should look at programs to support farmers to transition towards more ecologically sustainable products on lands that have already been deforested. I think it would be great to look at some innovative payment for ecosystem services uh, arrangements, which could be funded through a combination of, you know, taxes or, you know, uh, contributions from public banks or even from the EU. I can clearly hear that you're very supportive of the EU deforestation regulation and the direction that is taken. What do you think of private initiatives that aim to curb deforestation, such as RSPO? Private commitments and certification have made some progress in terms of developing practices and trying out what works and doesn't work. But I think the limitations of these approaches always remain that they're not across they're 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 limited to a fairly small part of the sector so that's one limitation and then you secondly have the problem that there is a real uh, accountability and monitoring problem in certification systems the certification standards in the cocoa sector themselves uh, rainforest alliance and fair trade have said very clearly that that we can't we cannot achieve the, the resolution of this problem on our own we need Regulation. Do you think that the approach the EU has taken, that of uh, implementing a, a prohibition-based regulation, is also an approach that should be expanded to other cocoa-consuming countries or regions, such as the US, the UK? Certainly. I mean, I think it will be it would be a problem if it wasn't, uh, because of course then you ha end up having the risk of leakage, where the unsustainable production continues and is just sold to an unregulated consumer market. Besides the regulatory approach, do you think there is a good place for enhanced co uh, cooperation and partnerships between consuming and producing countries to support compliance with the regulation and also to achieve the broader goal of fighting deforestation. From Fern's perspective, this is absolutely critical that you need to have both the 
strong signal sent by the demand side regulation, but this needs to be coupled with a smart approach on the supply side as well to kind of transform that signal into change on the ground. Uh, and I think that's important for, for two purposes, both of which you alluded to. Uh, the first is just in the short term, just to prepare you know, farmers and producer countries for compliance. And then once they have that understanding, providing the funding that's necessary uh, to do that. And I think working via the national traceability systems, which the EU is currently doing, is is a really good approach. So basically to really uh, fight global deforestation, it has to be an effort amongst all the key stakeholders. Yes in the cocoa supply chain. Thank you so much, Julia. This has been a very insightful uh, dialogue on a very important topic. Clearly, legislation has an important role to play, to build a level playing field and to create the market pool for sustainably sourced raw materials. So staying, Christian, on our thriving nature pillar, we have a commitment to become carbon net zero by 2050. But how do we achieve that? What approaches should companies take? And critically, what should companies consider to make them credible? So for that, I had an interview with Marianne Valley, CEO of SustainCert. Marianne, welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, your time to have this conversation with us today. We know that there's really two approaches in terms of carbon emissions. So there's the offsetting and the insetting. Could you maybe give me an overview on what it actually means? Sure. The way we define insetting at SustainCert is to say really simply that an insetting strategy is about reducing a company's indirect emissions through interventions that take place within the value chain of the company. Whereas offsetting is not about reducing your own emissions, it's about financing emission reductions outside your own footprint. We have actually transitioned from offsetting to insetting with a significant agroforestry approach. How important that is it that companies have a conservation approach to reducing their, their carbon emissions? We do see that Barry Calbot's approach, which is to work on reductions within its value chain, as well as protecting carbon sinks and generating uh, carbon removals, is really critical because beyond the climate benefits that this generates, there are also benefits in terms of uh, livelihoods for cocoa producers, uh, soil uh, health benefits, as well as um, also uh, other sort of um, uh, non-climate related benefits. So those are really important uh, actions that go beyond climate, climate change. Going forward for us, what advice would you give to us in terms of achieving our insetting ambition? I would advise Barry Calbot to continue to drive quality and credibility in the industry through a commitment to data quality. I would also advise Barry Calbot to continue to drive collective action in the industry because scope three emissions are by nature shared responsibility. No one, no one company can solve scope three uh, reductions. It has to be uh, a collective effort. And so continue, continuing to drive collective action across the industry is critical for the success of Barry Calbot and the industry. That's clear. So quality of data and collective action should definitely drive us forward uh, into the future. Thank you very much for your time, Marion. Thank you. I think that was a very important comment from Marion that a credible carbon strategy requires both a reduction approach, but also a neutralization approach. And with that, we are closing the deep dive on our third pillar on thriving nature and moving to our fourth pillar, sustainable ingredients. Body Callabout has committed to have by 2030 100% certified or verified ingredients in all of its products, all traceable to farm level. Sounds like an ambitious target, Christian. But how do we get there? For that, I had a discussion with Vim and Oliver. Wim, Oliver, thank you very much for your time. Oliver, I'm going to jump to you first. 
our Forever Chocolate target to 2025 of 100% sustainable ingredients. We've now adapted that slightly, which includes now the additional verification certification to traceability to farm level. What does that mean for us in terms of the way that we, we source? The wording change that you mentioned to verified or certified ingredients makes a lot of sense. We have changed the way we source since 2016, since the launch of our chocolate. We changed the wording from sustainable sourcing to certified or verified, which makes a lot of sense. So we're trying to be more precise there. The additional five years that we get from 25 to 30 are really important for us. We're uh, at a large part of our ingredients that we source sustainably. Uh, or certified and verified in the future. But we have a long tail of smaller volumes of more complicated suppliers, less advanced suppliers in regions where we do need the extra five years. So covering those more complicated supply chains. And in terms of um, certification, um, there are criticisms of certification. We use certification and verification. What would your answer be to those criticisms? We do think that certification is an important first step. And what became clear is that we have to go beyond certification to establish sustainable supply chains. So you need to go beyond certification and do things in addition, uh, whether it's on child labor, on ensuring human rights, on monitoring deforestation in your supply chains. And that is what we do. We, have, we work with certification as the basis it's also important to uh, drive the implementation of sustainable practices on farm, but you have to go beyond. And um, we do that in Cocoa Horizons, for example, in our vision data program in Coconut, so uh, where we work with farmers directly and make sure that the impact that we want to see on the ground is really happening. Sustainably sourced is one thing, but sustainably sold is something else. Are consumers willing to buy sustainable products? Maybe let's look at what do we sell today as sustainable. That's 50% of our products. And of course, important because we want to do more. What does it take to buy from us more sustainable products? Then we need to look at the consumer. Is the consumer willing to pay more? The consumer is looking at a brand which he can trust. So it's, for me, it's all about trust. Can he trust the brand? And if you look at it from the brand point of view, is it a purposeful brand? Wim mentions trust. How important is traceability for us and to achieve where we want to go? Very. Uh, in a context of trust, you can't work on sustainability without knowing where the products, where the ingredients that you need really come from, right? So it's, it's a precondition to sustainability, which is why we're focusing on it. A question for you, Wim, on another hot topic. We know that EU legislation is coming in soon. What is the viewpoint from our customers? What are they asking from us? You have the, the bigger consumer brands, they're also very much on top of the topic, but there's a big group of customers that look at us, or in fact, they're not aware, and therefore they just rely on to make sure that we're compliant with legislation. And the legislation is a good thing, eh? because it helps for that level playing field to move, uh, to move all brands, all private label, all products, all customers, to take them to the next level. What do you think would be, or what is the main derailer for us to stop us achieving where we want to go? It's not about a small initiative here and a small initiative here, which looks nice on camera. It's really about a big scale that we need, to, or it's a big move that we need to make all together. And I would like to add what you often see with customers, and it's also with other dynamics the same, who goes first. Typically, you have the more innovative brands that go first, but then you have a large majority of smaller brands, also private label, who's like having cold feet. Do I go first or not? Oliver, anything to, to add to that? Oh, I think Wim really nailed it. We need everyone upstream, downstream the supply chain, our critics as well, NGOs, media, customers, consumers also to help us create a movement to really be successful. Taryn, I really enjoyed the interview. I now better understand why we extended our deadline and added more ambition, focusing on traceability. And with that, we are closing the deep dive on our fourth pillar, sustainable sourcing. It's almost time for the Q&A. It is, and now I think is the time to really start thinking about the types of questions that you want to pose to our experts. But before we jump into that, Christian, let's go for a wrap up from our Chief Procurement Officer, Massimo Selmo, and President of Global Coco, Stephen Retzlaff. 
1996, you both actually started with Barry Calibert, a wealth of experience in terms of sustainability and sourcing. Here we are in 2023, the launch today of our sharpened forever chocolate strategy. How do you feel? And do you think we're focusing on the right things? What excites me is, is the fact that I feel that we've got a great program that we understand so much better today, what we want to achieve. And we have the people that can focus on it and make it happen. And I'm looking forward to, to seeing the impact as we move forward. Well, as, as Stephen just, uh, uh, just said, uh, we have uh, accumulated a lot of experience and this is, uh, of course, uh, a big asset. We have built, uh, first of all, definition that we are even not existing, but more than anything else, we have built also a very capable team deployed uh, globally that can uh, guarantee us to be successful in implementing the strategy. Let's talk about traceability. It's a big topic. How important is it for COCO and how doable is it? Yeah. So it's very important because if we want to understand, um, if we want to address the topic of deforestation, we have to have traceability. We need to know that we're not contributing to deforestation. So from that perspective, it's very important. But also from the perspective of understanding the impact that our programs are having on the ground, we need to be able to connect those programs with the supply of our beans uh, so that we can talk uh, with confidence about the change that we're driving. Now, the other dimension of it is we also see that at a uh, government level, so at EU level, there, there are regulatory changes that are taking place, but also at origin country level, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, this is firmly on the agenda. So traceability is going to happen. What about for you, Massimo, beyond cocoa, the, the other ingredients? How important is it to, to achieve traceability and will we, will we get there? As, uh, as Stephen explained, it's, it's uh, very important to have it, uh, to have traceability. So it, it's something that uh, has to be uh, addressed with uh, also using different technologies depending on uh, which type of crop we are talking. Uh, so there is not a one uh, fit for all solution, uh, but nonetheless, uh, by now we can say that uh, also uh, several uh, regulation and compliance are forcing all actor along value chain more and more to comply with that. And uh, this makes us uh, much more comfortable that uh, we will be uh, there as, uh, as we are committed to. Some of our speakers deep dived into some pretty major topics. Um, we saw the topic of price, for example, between Anthony and Nicola. How does our Forever Chocolate strategy address price and is it doing it adequately enough? Yeah, so when you look at price, uh, <clears throat> we have to look at it from a couple different dimensions. One is the price that the farmer actually gets paid. Uh, and we look at the, the, the price that we might be paying for, for, for our cocoa beans, for example. And if we look at the farm gate price, the farmer gets paid and we compare that to the uh, export price or the free on board price, FOB price. What we see is when we look across the world, we see that the farmer gets a very different percentage of that price. We see countries, origin countries, where the farmer gets 90% of that price. We see origin countries where the farmer gets 50% of that price. So that is, when we talk about price, we need to be clear about which price we're talking about. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that through helping farmers become more professional, uh, that with the pricing that you have in place, as well as with the sustainability premiums that we're paying, that we can put those farmers on a path to a sustainable, to a living income. But obviously it can be helped uh, through through government policies that will also enable that journey as well. So we're focusing on all of those different dimensions. Final question to both of you. What would you say is our toughest target to meet and how do you think we're going to get there? So from my perspective, the CO2 target will be the toughest one, the net zero target. I think uh, we've got a lot of the elements that we're focusing on that are gonna help get us uh, towards that target. But I think the, the key message is it's gonna take all of Barry Calabout. And we're really gonna to have to work across the whole chain to make it happen. And that's cocoa, non-cocoa, that's also in our factories, et cetera, and, and, and the way we conduct our business overall. So um, 
I would say that's our toughest target. I share that. Maybe I would also add one toughest target is also, you know, we are acting globally. And while we are, uh, let's say, operating in geography, where the sensitivity for any sustainability to topic is, is already rather high, we are also acting in geography where this is not high at all. And it's uh, maybe starting only now. And that is uh, uh, making our challenge possibly more difficult because we don't want to compromise while at the same time uh, we have to convince actors that uh, at this point in time they have uh, different priorities than ours, right? We're a growth company. So every year that we grow, our challenge becomes that much bigger. So I think that uh, finding the combination of being a growth company and achieving our overall goals is, is another factor as to why this is such, a, such an ambitious target. Thank you both for your time. Clearly a wealth of experience and knowledge and a very interesting chat. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tari. Thank you, Tara. Welcome back. I hope that gave you some insights into our new sharpened strategy. Now it's time for the Q&A. And with us, we have two colleagues that you have just seen in the last 45 minutes, uh, Nicola and uh, Oliver. And we have a big screen in front of us. You cannot see it, but we can, where we see all of your questions coming in. And we're going to do our uttermost best to answer as many questions as possible. And Nicholas, I'm going to put you right away on the spot. First question that came in, you've put out new sharpened forever chocolate targets. Are they more or less ambitious than the previous ones? Uh, for, me, they are, for me, they are more ambitious. Uh, they are ambitious both in the target and in the way we're going to implement them. Uh, if you take some of the targets, uh, we can take the one around traceability, being 100% traceable. For me, that's hugely ambitious. Even if you take the net zero, I would agree with what Stephen has just said. For me, it's a, a way more ambitious agenda than with the one we had back in 16, because we're basically committed over the next uh, 30 years to completely decarbonize the business. But I'm also super excited by the, the, the ambition in the approach uh, and the fact that we are very clear on how to do things. Uh, so just to give you an example, for me, the, uh, the fact that we're acknowledging that knowledge is probably not the, the problem and that farmers know how to farm cocoa and that therefore we need to reposition our approach from uh, doing less training uh, to basically be more involved in accompanying farmer and investing more in their farm. For me, that's very bold. Mm -hmm. S staying on the, the topic of ambition, the next question is, you had a commitment to be zero child labor by 2025. Yes. Is Barry Calabat going back on its commitment? We are not, so we're still committed to eradicate uh, child labor 100%. You will have seen also in the target that we are committed to remediate 100% of the case uh, we identify. Same thing, I also think that there's a lot of ambition in the approach. Uh, we don't necessarily believe that uh, an individualized approach of taking every case one by one uh, is the right approach. And for us, moving to more systemic uh, and, and community-based approach uh, is the right thing to do. Then we also want to be honest and we also want to acknowledge that uh, child labor will not be eradicated uh, in, in three years. Uh, just to give an, an example, if you take the US at the moment, you, you have probably more than a million cases of, of child labor. Uh, so yes, it's, uh, it's, it's an honest statement to say that 25 will, child labor will not be eradicated, but our, our, our commitment is 100% towards eradication of child labor. Mm. Oliver. Turning to you, we just heard from Stephen and Massimo the importance of traceability. Um, clearly, Forever Chocolate is not just about cocoa, it's about all ingredients. Can you elaborate a little bit for a, an important commodity for body color, for example, palm oil, how we are working there on traceability? Yeah, so the traceability commitment extends to ingredients too, of course, it includes palm oil too. We heard before traceability is important in a regulatory context, but also key in our no deforestation uh, activities, making sure that we achieve our targets there and in our decarbonization work. So overall, without traceability, you don't know where your products are coming from that you source. And so it is a precondition for us to achieve our targets. And I'm happy that we've made that very clear now uh, in our new sharpened commitment for 2030. So not just a focus for cocoa, but for all our ingredients. For all of the ingredients, particularly palm oil, you mentioned that example that are high risk ingredients in terms of deforestation, for example, it's absolutely key for us. Clear. A, a broader uh, a question for you, Nicola. Can you explain in more detail why public, why public intervention is needed? 
Yes, uh, particularly referring to our 2030 uh, prospering farmer commitment, uh, we basically advocate for quite a radical uh, transformation of, uh, of the way cocoa is farmed. Uh, if you take one example that we, we saw in the debate with, uh, with Anthony Fontaine, the one around uh, size of farm, we agree that the bigger the farm, the lower the yield is, but we also agree that uh, bigger farm is a key uh, ingredient in the recipe for success. If you take Ivory Coast or Ghana, probably average size of cocoa farm is towards 2 to 2.5 hectares. That's simply not enough. Uh, so we need uh, a certain form of, of, of land consolidation. And obviously that's, uh, that's something on which we need uh, uh, ambitious agricultural policy in, uh, in producing country. Good. Oliver, turning, uh, turning back to you. Um, a question coming in about the way we reworded our target on sustainable sourcing, saying it's now also about certification um, and verification. Um, are those two the same thing necessarily? They are not, which is why we decided to change the wording to certified and verified. We wanted to be more precise about what we mean with our commitments, which is why we move away, away from uh, sustainable, which is also a piece of feedback that we've received from many stakeholders. And now with a wording around certified and verified, I think we're more, more specific uh, about what we're actually committing to for 2030. Okay, but not less credible in your view. Absolutely, more credible, I think. Um, if you look at sustainable, sustainability as a concept, uh, you'll ask uh, 20 people, they'll give you 20 definitions of what, what it actually means, right? So we're certified and verified, we're just much more precise in what we mean. Okay. Next one for you, Nicola. So considering your new report is saying that higher prices need to be part of it, how are you raising prices in the new Forever Chocolate commitments? So first of all, important for me to remind that uh, we pay higher price on sustainable beans. So any sustainable beans comes with a, with a, a cash premium. So let's put it out there. Second thing is a bit, again, what we were saying in the debate, I think we want to move beyond the divide of it's all about price or it's all about yield. For us, it's the combination of price, yield increase and bigger farm that, that makes it a success. Then to be more specific on what could happen, I can, I can give you the example of, of Ghana, uh, where um, something quite simple could be done. Uh, at the moment, the, the price paid to farmer, the farm gate price, is fixed on an annual basis, on a, on a Ghanaian cities basis, whereas uh, the product is exported in dollar. If you take the last uh, two years in Ghana, uh, the cities was uh, massively devaluated, uh, which means that uh, by fixing the price to farmer in cities, you ask basically farmer uh, to take the foreign exchange risk. It could be potentially uh, manageable to define a farm gate price in dollar and to ask people like us to translate uh, that, that dollar equivalent in local currency and therefore to protect farmer from, from the risk of foreign exchange. So there's a lot of mechanism that can happen. I think back to also what Stephen was saying for us, the discussion has to be around farm gate price, the price paid to farmer. And historically, a lot of the discussion has been around the export price. And we want a refocus on the price that, on the cash that farmer, that farmer gets. Very, very interesting. Um, Oliver, question came in about the um, target on sustainable sourcing. It was uh, first meant to be achieved by 2025. Now it talks about 100% certified and verified by 2030. What was the key reason that we extended uh, the timing? And how do you feel that compares with some, what some others are doing in the market? So if uh, you look at what we'll be busy doing as of 2025, we're going to approach the last 20% of uh, volumes that we, that we source. So you'll be at 80 around 2025, more or less. Plus my, at least 80%. Yeah. Um, so um, those last 20% come from origins that are more complicated farming systems that are more complicated to transform into a sustainable farming system. We're looking at more complex supply chains. We're addressing uh, world regions where sustainability is, let's say, less advanced, where it's, it has been less of a topic in the past 20 years compared to Europe, for example. And so, and we're looking at a, at a long tail of um, lower volume ingredients where we have less leverage in supply chains and in sectors. Mm. Um, and so we'll need those additional five years to tackle those remaining 20% that, that we'll find in all honesty as of 2025. I think we need to be straightforward about that. Yeah. Yep. Good. 
you said, sorry, the second part of the question, uh, how do we compare? You're right, sorry. Uh, exactly, yes. how do we monitor? So we report uh, transparently <clears throat> about the proportion of um, ingredients that we source, verified or certified. And so we think that's, that's, uh, that's uh, creating a level playing field with everyone who can actually follow our progress uh, on uh, this, this commitment that we have. Okay. Yeah. Next question uh, is around traceability and deforestation. What becomes of farmers within the supply chain having farms in protected areas considering their present poverty level? That's uh, also a, a key question. Uh, there is uh, cocoa coming from uh, from protected area. If you take the example of, of Ivory Coast, you have different estimate, but roughly uh, it's estimated that 15 to 25 percent of, of cocoa come from protected area. I think here it's really important to make the difference between the mean and the end. And, and traceability for me is a mean and not necessarily the end. What, it, what our responsibility is, is to make sure that we develop full traceability system. We also have very uh, ambitious and elaborate alert system where we can uh, spot uh, loss of cover loss and, and, uh, and, and loss of, of tree. Um, and we can avoid sourcing from this deforested area and we've made huge progress on that. But at the end of the day, uh, cocoa is a, is a liquid commodity. So that cocoa co from coming from protected area always end up on the, on the market. So at the end of the day, what will need to happen is that this farm in protected area will have to be uh, removed. Uh, and that's uh, something that uh, government needs to take care of. And our responsibility is to create an enabling environment where we create uh, alternative source of income for, for farmers. But it's really the combination of traceability on one side, but also acknowledging that protected area are very well defined. We know where they are. There are cocoa farms in this protected area and this cocoa farm needs to be relocated. Yes. Uh, Oliver, a bit of a technical question here for you. Um, when you look at sustainability as body color about, do you also look at the use of chemical fertilizers and phytochemical products? Uh, of course, it's part of <coughs> our commitments, <coughs> but there <coughs> I would hand over actually to my colleague Nicola uh, Probably the question is more about cocoa. So maybe on, the, on our side, I think really important to make the distinction between pesticide and fertilizer. Mm -hmm. For me, those are two very different uh, questions. Uh, on, on pesticide, so typically insecticide or, or fungicide, we acknowledge that particularly in West Africa, there's an overuse uh, of insecticide. At the moment, probably 85, 90% of farmers are using uh, uh, insecticide. That's probably way too, way too much. Uh, and we really want to be a lot more targeted based on farm assessment, identification of pest and disease, and only applying when needed. Also worth mentioning that uh, obviously under sustainable requirement, we have a list of banned products mm -hmm. and that when we facilitate access to, a, to a, um, a chemical product, we obviously make sure that it comply with, uh, with this list. And then on the fertilizer side, same thing. I think we, we would embrace the, uh, uh, the theme of uh, regenerative agriculture, but we also want to go there with our eyes wide open. If I take a, a quick example, at the moment on, on mineral fertilizer, we probably apply or a farmer would apply on average 500 kilograms per hectare. If you want to replace that with uh, compost, for example, well, you need to generate five to six tons of compost uh, to replace that, meaning that you need to find organic matter, you need to manage logistic, and it costs more money. So mm -hmm. we also have a lot of customers that say, can you replace mineral fertilizer? And we say, sure, but we have big uh, challenge to address. And by the way, keep in mind that there is a reason why mineral fertilizer are used is because sometimes they are cheaper and that therefore we need to factor a higher cost of, um, uh, of, of production if we want to move to a regenerative agriculture. I'll take take the next one. Uh, I think this is also for you, Nicola. Will you look to lobby the EU to adapt any elements of the EU deforestation regulation before it is implemented? Or are you confident current proposals can be implemented without too much disruption to the industry? Well, I'll, I'll, fo I'll focus more on the second part of the question without too much disruption to the industry. I think we're, we're, we're not afraid of disruption. Uh, so the industry will be disrupted. Uh, we welcome that. Uh, we think that needs, uh, things need to change, uh, particularly when it comes to deforestation. Um, a lot of our discussion in-house at the moment are also towards you know, understanding the physical consequences of that. There will be uh, a cocoa that will be discarded and that's a good thing. Uh, so we are all for disruption, and, uh, but we're also ready for, for the implementation of that, uh, of, of that uh, regulation and we think it's a very good news. Yes. I actually think that Body Government has also been publicly uh, supporting the regulation. 100%. Yeah. 
Good. Um, Oliver, a question came up on Vision Dairy, a program that we have, of course, been uh, been working on uh, to look at, uh, amongst other things, the, the, the carbon footprint of dairy. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Absolutely happy to. I mean, Vision Dairy is about uh, making dairy farming more sustainable. And in Vision Dairy, we actually define what is a um, sustainable dairy farm for us. And Vision Dairy is mainly about three things. It's farm performance, it's about animal welfare, and it's about uh, environmental protection and, and environmental performance as well. And so we take that standard to understand where our dairy suppliers are in implementing their sustainability efforts. Um, we see that uh, a lot of dairy farmers and suppliers are quite advanced, particularly in Europe and the US, but then we do need to engage more with smaller suppliers to get them to a level of, of sustainability where we need to be by 2030. Mm. And so those extra five years, again, uh, help us uh, or give us more time to work with some of these uh, suppliers as well. Clear. Good. Another question on traceability. When you discuss traceability, I think of two questions. To what extent will this be granular? Will you retain the data in-house or will you disclose this data to the public? Uh, I'll start with the second part of the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the question. First of all, you will remember that I think a couple of years ago, we disclosed uh, the network of cooperatives from where we yes. source. So that's public information. I would also um, mention that we were asked by government of Ivory Coast and Ghana to uh, um, hand them over our polygons, mm -hmm. so the map of the uh, of the farms that are in our database, and we we did it, uh, and we also did it because we completely support the fact that traceability system needs to be uh, owned uh, and developed by by, by government. So this data will be public, and on the on on the first uh, part of the question, it's going to be very granular, <laughs> extremely granular. Um, and, and for me, it's, it's probably also a good way of reminding what we, what we do. At the moment, we do two things. We, we map, uh, meaning that we provide polygons uh, for all the farms from, uh, and all the plots from the farmers in our database. The second thing is we, we implement what we call a yield control, which is for me quite, quite innovative. Uh, we, we cap the volume we source from 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 certain uh, field because uh, it's not enough to map. You also need to make sure that you don't buy more than what that land is supposed to uh, to produce. And the third thing, which for me is extremely granular, is the uh, is the alert system. So again, we are uploading all our polygons actually also on ingredients uh, in a, in a platform that was developed by Swift uh, Geospatial, and that allow us to overlap any tree cover loss with our polygons and then. If we see a tree cover loss that is close enough to one of our polygons, then we will investigate uh, that alert. And, and that's very granular because if you, if you prune, for example, uh, um, uh, a cocoa field, that's a tree cover loss. So sometimes through the alert system, we can uh, identify things that are not deforestation, which means that the granularity will go as far as actually, you know, going out there and checking. Wow. So it's really the three elements, the polygon, the yield control and the alerts. Yes. Okay. Good. So. Unfortunately, there's someone waving at me, indicating clearly that we're running out of time. So we are going to um, we're going to close the Q and A session. But I will ask one final question: Whether you have any final thoughts, starting with you, Nicola? Yeah, I just want to finish on the message of pride. Uh, for me, I'm really I'm really <coughs> proud of the team. Uh, really proud of the of the guys here in Zurich, but also. I want to remind um, or remember my, my pride for the guys in country. Uh, we have, you know, thousands of people uh, in Cameroon, in Brazil, in Ecuador, in, in Ivory Coast, uh, every day uh, planting seeds, growing seedlings, uh, implementing agroforestry, deploying labor groups. So a, a big kudos and a big thank you to these guys. And also um, just want to mention the pride of, uh, of our approach of saying it's not about knowledge, it's about doing. Uh, I think it might, it might sound very simple, but for me, it's very bold uh, to acknowledge that uh, farmers don't have to be taught. Uh, they have to be supported. Fan super, fantastic. Thank you. Nicola Oliver, same question for you. Any final thoughts? Adding to the message of pride, I'd like to add a message of excitement. I'm really excited about this, um, driving forward the journey that we started, particularly in close collaboration with our customers. And so... Really looking forward to that and uh, can't wait actually to, to get going. Fantastic. Thank you. So there are still questions on the screen. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. If you have asked a question that was not answered, do reach out to us.
And speaking of thank yous, thank you to all of those who engaged with us on the discussions. Thank you also to you, Nicola, and to you, Oliver. And thank you for joining us virtually as well. Now, uh, for further information, please also have a look. We published a lot today on our website and also follow us on our social media channels as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us on our journey to make sustainable chocolate the norm.